Hi, I'm Tom Long. On the Wednesday before we celebrated the 4th of July, I went for a walk around the neighborhood and I just took the time to appreciate the beautiful gardens and flower beds and uh, the trees that people had, flowering trees that people had planted in their yards. And uh, as we study the gospel lesson for the seventh Sunday after Pentecost, let's consider what that gospel story has in common with the yards and the landscapes and the plantings that we uh, will see in the uh, background video today. The pace of Mark's gospel seldom slackens. In fact, one of his favorite words is uh, usually translated uh, immediately. And Mark uses that word 20 times before our gospel story even begins in chapter 6. So you can see this is what, what Mark is trying to convey is that if you were one of the disciples in those few years of Jesus' earthly ministry, things were happening right and left. They were happening quickly. And it was like this happened, then immediately that happened, and then this happened, and then that happened. And so when we look at our story, we should look at it in the context of these things that are happening one after the other. For example, in, the, in chapter 5, the previous chapter, Jesus had uh, cast demons out of a Gentile demoniac. He crossed over the uh, valley and met this person, delivered him from those demons, came back over to his side of the, of the valley and ran into the leader of a synagogue whose daughter was dying. And on his way, before he even gets there, on his way to help uh, Jairus and his daughter, he's interrupted by a woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. And she is delivered by Jesus. And then Jesus continues right away, immediately, Mark might say, and Jesus continues on then to Jairus' house and raises his daughter who died while he was in, while Jesus was interacting with the hemorrhaging lady. Uh, he raises that daughter from the dead. And so that's the context. These things are happening right and left and right and left. And then Jesus comes skidding into Nazareth. And we might wonder, how are the people that watched him grow up? How are the people that know his family? How are they going to receive him? And I'm reminded of an experience that I had when I was in the army. Um, we were in Grenada and most of the troops came home and there was a big parade. At the time it was called Fort Bragg and it's Fort Liberty now. There was a big parade and everybody came out and my wife was disappointed to find out that I and my buddies were not in the parade. In fact, we weren't even home. <laughs> we were still in Grenada tying up the mission. And when we did come home, uh, nobody had been notified that we were coming. And so we arrived and uh, got in our cars and drove home like it was just uh, another day in, in garrison. And Yet that was a better welcome than some of the folks that were in the army before me and served in Vietnam. When they came back, they were spit on and, and abused and had a terrible reception when they came to their homes. So uh, I think in many ways, the way that what Jesus experienced when he came into Nazareth was closer to what the Vietnam vets experienced even than what I experienced because he gets there and instead of them celebrating the fact that he's doing all of these works and wonders, instead of celebrating the wonderful teaching that he is bringing out of the scriptures, instead of celebrating that, they're asking the question like, well, who does this guy think he is? He's just the son of a carpenter. I know his mother. I know his brothers. I know his sisters. Hey, he ain't no thing. And because of that preconception of who Jesus is and what he could do, the Bible tells us that Jesus couldn't work any miracles among them. 
When the NIV says that they, quote, quote, took offense at him, that's a translation of a, a turn of phrase that basically is saying that they were scandalized by him, by him to the point that they were ensnared by their own preconceptions. And that brings them down, that causes them to, to stumble. At some point in our spiritual development, we all come across times in which what we experience doesn't fit with the way we thought God or Jesus would or should act. It can be a hard pill to swallow when we find out that Jesus isn't bound by our expectations. Jesus is going to do his Jesus thing, whether we or anyone else likes it. He gets to do that. He's God. And yet, the Nazarene's low expectations resulted in a pause in that furious pace of Jesus' miracles and wonders. And the Bible says he could not do any miracles there because they couldn't believe that he could help them. His homies didn't seek his help or receive his help. Mark seemingly reluctantly added, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. <laughs> Only those desperate enough to seek his help received it. I'm guessing the lack of faith from the people who knew him best must have stung. Jesus may be God, but he was also fully human. And that rejection had to hurt. But Mark tells us that the pace of ministry immediately shifted back into gear. Jesus moved on. He peels out and goes to the next villages and begins teaching in those villages. He even began to send the disciples off in pairs. And now these six pairs of disciples went out preaching repentance and driving out demons and healing the sick. In a gospel pattern that will become familiar over time, whenever the opposing side appears to have the lead for a time, buckle up. Because Team Jesus is going to make a comeback and start spreading truth and justice coupled with love and mercy and that light will beat back the darkness. Back in Mark chapter 4 verses 1 through 20 we studied the parable of the sower. Remember that one? I think the parable of the sower describes this section of Mark's gospel pretty well. Jesus and those he gives authority to do so cast out the seed of of God's word. The birds eat some of it off the path and it doesn't grow. Some falls on rocky ground and withers away as quickly as they sprout up. Other seeds grow longer but end up choked off by weeds. But some seed only grows, not only, but some seed not only grows, but produces a crop of more seed whether it's Jesus casting seed, the 12 disciples casting seed, or you or me casting seed, it isn't all going to grow up and bear fruit. But in the end, God always brings in a harvest. The neighborhood looks great this summer, but not all of our plants did well. And yes, there are some weeds here and there, but it is just a delightful place to walk and to consider the promises of Scripture. For example, the Apostle Paul observed, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. And then in another passage, God told the prophet Isaiah, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose 
for which I sent it. Lord, many around us live in fear and despair, but our hope is in you and in the power of your words of truth and love and in the power of your spirit working through your people. Make us champions of and examples of your justice and your tender mercies. May your light so shine through us that you achieve the purposes for which you sent us into the world that you love. Amen. I wish for you, my friend, this happiness that I found. You can depend on Him. It matters not. I'll shout it from the